Hey, thanks for attending another session by Decoding Research, a series of webinars where we talk about uh, decoding research on research papers published uh, on topics such as deep learning, machine learning, and technology. Today's session, we're going to be talking about recognizing variables from their data via deep embeddings of distribution. This is a very interesting paper. Uh, this addresses uh, one of the areas uh, from a master and how can potentially uh, you know deep learning algorithms be used to address one part of the master data management uh, towards a more automated master data management. Uh, a little bit about the authors. Uh, now, uh, this paper was published in September 2019. I know it's an old paper, but it kind of caught the eye when we were working on one of the projects where we're dealing with uh, uh, a master data management problem, and that's where we trying to use AI. And uh, this paper is very, very interesting, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, on that in a, in a minute. The basically published by Jonas Mueller and Alex Smola, which currently working with Amazon. Uh, quickly getting into the abstract. Um, now the problem today with um, you know analytics and meta learning in general has generally been around different data, heterogeneous data sets, and they contain data. And there's there's a large possibility this data, uh, which uh, you know across heterogeneous data sets will you know which may end up having similar data, and the measurements uh, effectively the kind of you know point that these are the measurements from the same variables. Now, with no knowledge about what type of real-world data generated uh, that data, so how do human beings uh, generally kind of uh, you know adapt to this problem? Uh, so, human analysts presented with the same problem will solve by referring to knowledge gathered uh, from previously be seen data sets and their ability to recall the data. Now, I mean, that's obviously you know you would actually kind of uh, let's say if I'm dealing with data which is specifically in retail, and since I have kind of worked a lot of detail. So when I end up seeing new data in detail, which is kind of similar in nature, I would actually kind of you know go and pinpoint, hey, this probably looks from you know the retail, and with the retail it could be from this ontology, and that's how it works. Now the whole idea is trying to put that thinking into machine learning algorithm, but it's kind of difficult. So how do we get down that path? So machine learning they generally tend to you know build this capability by two ingredients. So one, they're going to organize a repository full of different data sets annotated with different, with innovative metadata regarding the performance of various computational techniques. Second piece is the ability to recognize which repository data set and hence the algorithms with them are relevant when presented with the new data. Now, the, the part where A is largely addressed by the public repo. You've seen a lot of public repo from OpenAI and uh, a lot more publicly available data. So you could probably end up using that to kind of train your data sets. Uh, this research paper aims primarily at P. That is identifying repository data set which contains some of the same variable present in a newly acquired data. So that in simpler terms, if I'm looking at a data uh, which could you know, which is something seen before, I would be in a position to kind of go back and say that, hey, this data is likely the similar data what uh, we've seen before, and and that makes my life a lot more easier. So, I mean, that's where the piece where the master data management really kind of comes in. So going deeper into the problem statement, the whole idea here is to uh, basically solve the problem of data which is similar across uh, different data sets. So given a previously unseen data table, uh, the aim is to automatically inflow what type of uh, variable was measured to generate uh, the observe, uh, observation of each column. Now essentially this is nothing but schema matching, which generally refer to grouping together columns in a data table that refer to the same attribute. Now schema matching, uh, I mean obviously there's a lot more uh, information on the web which you can actually go check out into what schema matching are and what are the different techniques which have already been in play. Uh, it was kind of going deeper into schema matching just to kind of set the context uh, is basically, um, let's take an example where we have data table buildings and data table people. Now one way to kind of uh, match the uh, uh, you know, data across the two is to kind of look at the column names and see if the address and street address, uh, you know, have the same meaning. But essentially, uh, and, and and then kind of, you know, from there onwards, try to uh, infer in some form or the other that uh, the data table buildings and people could end up having, um, you know, same similar data for address and street uh, address. However, this approach generally breaks down because column names are not intuitive. I mean, how often do we end up seeing column names in databases uh, when the developers end up 
putting color names, some of it would be in the form which are fairly cryptic and they don't really make sense. Now, this kind of breaks down and that is where the idea is to kind of go look at the data in each of these columns. And this is where distribution of the data really comes handy. So Mueller and Smola, uh, principal intervention is to bring a neural network to task uh, of comparing distribution and to use those neural networks to cluster low dimension encodings of columns instead of comparing them directly. So in simpler layman terms, they're trying to basically go ahead and build uh, a neural network, multi-layer neural network uh, or multiple networks in combination together, which are essentially kind of uh, going to compare distributions and then kind of arrive at a conclusion that uh, based on this distribution comparison, uh, the data across the two columns are similar by nature or they basically originate from uh, you know the same uh, column uh, which generated the observation. Now having kind of having a very clear context on the problem statement. Uh, now, where this can be used? Now, uh, from the very start of the conversation, I've been harping that uh, this is an area which can categorically be used in MDM. Uh, now, MDM is a method to use in business for enterprise to link all critical data to a common point of reference. Now, the technique in this paper is one of the techniques that, you know, for schema matching with deep embeddings, which can be used in the automated MDM pipeline. We've done that. We found this paper very useful. The results are very, very promising, I can tell you. And now going further into what is this problem in you know, a paper trying to solve now. Uh, the goal here is to previously, you know, given the previously unseen data table, an idea here is automatically for what type of variables was measured to generate the observation of each of this column. Now, unseen data with lack of informative variables like column name, which I was ta talking to earlier. For example, the age in a person is recorded as age, and some data set can be years. Mm -hmm. Methodology presented here aims to match variables solely based on data value with distribution, which I was kind of talking to earlier. The main idea of this approach is to use uh, this data set to learn a vector embedding for each set of the data values, such that data set which stem from the same variables are embedded closer to one another. So it kind of plays on the principles of embedding where basically it arrives at a conclusion that, you know, the similar variables, the data is likely to be, you know, closer to one another. And that's where the Euclidean distance really kind of comes in. Crux is Mueller and Smaller's method is to train a neural network to produce embedding based on column distribution. Now with columns, you know, converted to embedding, they can be clustered together for using for fast approximate nearest neighbor algorithm. The figure on the right shows a visualization of this cluster embedding projected in two dimensional space where the relationship between visual space and semantic meaning uh, uh, of the columns is clear. So I think it's pretty clear that you can actually see age and year and time and uh, you know they tend to cluster one around one another. So based on taking this principle ahead, uh, you know what Mueller and Smaller have actually done, we'll kind of dig deeper into what's really kind of going inside behind the scenes. Now, essentially, how are they trying to solve this problem? How is it really done? They're just taking two, two neural nets. Uh, H theta, which uh, it's, it's, it's a neural net and it's the whole sole purpose is to kind of produce the embeddings for each columns. Now, G, uh, which learns to produce an adjustment in terms of the common, uh, how common the distribution. Now, G is a very important Piece. And we'll talk to that a little later, because that's where, uh, you know, the, it kind of uh, addresses a lot of areas in schema matching. Typically, uh, you know, one a good example would be in terms of you are dealing with a Boolean column, uh, which is yes and no. And uh, similarly, uh, you know, you're dealing with another, uh, you know, similar Boolean column, but they don't seem to have originated from the same source. And so they may end up having distribution right. Uh, so this is where GV really plays in a very pivotal role in terms of uh, bringing that adjustment, in, you know, in, in you know uh, to calculate the probability of uh, these two column sets being similar. Now H and GV interact to produce probability PIJ that two columns DI and DJ refer to the same variable. Now, kind of digging deeper under the hoods in terms of what's really going on. So let's first get out of the way in terms of inputs and outputs. So very simplistic uh, inputs that we're dealing with, uh, we containing, you know, we take a start off with a repository R, which has data since D1 to Dn, and uh, then, and here uh, Di and D, Dy are set of column values. So, and Y is the matches in terms of one zero. So basically when you feed the neural net, you're go gonna take a bunch of column, uh, you know, basically each, each become, you know, your 
observations uh, and uh, you know where where there are matches you kind of go ahead and put uh, you know di and dy is is a one and when there are uh, no non matches are basically kind of go ahead and put zero so that's that's where we kind of go and what are we really trying to solve with di and dj uh, refer to the same so having um, a reasonably good handle on the inputs now let's kind of get under the hoods uh, in terms of seeing how you know how both the neural nets uh, h and g kind of work together H essentially is the neural net which is going to learn to produce the embeddings for each column. Essentially, it's basically uh, comparing the distances between the two distribution. If you really compare distrib the distance between two distribution, assuming uh, you have embedding uh, involved in these pieces, um, that's where the Euclidean uh, distances really come into play. So d theta p1 p2 essentially the Euclidean difference between the two. Uh, H the neural net uh, with parameters theta. And you know it compares the distribution via squared nuclear and distances, uh, and that's how we kind of get around uh, to the first uh, output of H. So essentially, uh, d theta d1 d2 is a, is basically squared distances, squared differences uh, between the distributions, and where h of theta di is a summation of uh, you know the point di over the dist of the embedding space. Uh, <clears throat> once we've kind of got an output from H. Essentially, the output from X is a fixed size vector representation. Uh, we know which is you know which is the starting point for us to kind of take it to the next step. But however, wait, you know, just comparing, uh, you know, taking the difference between the distribution is not really going to solve your problem. We see there are problems with that. Uh, three essential problems which we're going to talk about. The first is the inability to ignore natural variations. So this is a case uh, where you have two, uh, you know, two columns. Uh, or two, da you know, two data sets which, uh, you know, which come from the same variable temperature. Example, uh, apparently one is measured in Fahrenheit, another measure measured in Celsius. Now, uh, or they from two different geographical regions, resulting in temperature measurement ap appearing in different data sets, which may not be fully distributed similarly. Uh, and issues described better, like patch effects, sampling bias, covariant shares. However, the paper kind of goes on to talk the data set embedding proposed in this method can still recognize the new data sets from these same variables even when the data distribution is similar. So that's a point we need to kind of test it out and we've tested it out and it actually does work. But and how does it really work is something which I'm going to explain in the next slide. Uh, uh, now, inability to distinguish between different variables whose data distribution happen to be same. Classical example is Boolean. Obviously, it's going to be used in more than one data set. Uh, the distribution may or may not be the same thing. But apparently, this paper goes on to uh, in a talk about by learning from data repo, uh, which sorts distribution uh, are naturally common between unrelated variables. The proposed method remains able to distinguish new variables with the same common distribution. The last piece is computational efficiency, which I think is a no-brainer. Uh, currently, they're dealing with embeddings, and you know, if you really kind of go with fastest approximate nearest neighbor, you really don't end up spending a lot of computation. Uh, so, computation inefficiency is really not a point to be discussed. Now, moving on further, I want to dig a little deeper, you know, in terms of the model similarity. So, general strategies to learn the neural nets, which infer likelihood that two data sets stem from the same shared variable via scalable stochastic gradient methods. Now the PIJ, which is a, which is nothing but the probability, uh, you know, that DI and DJ stem from the same attribute. Obviously, they can be zero and one. Now denote the probability of data sets DI and DJ via parameterized form. PIJ is is, a, is a, you know exp exponential of minus DNJ. Now where DIJ is essentially uh, the distances between the the Euclidean distances between um, you know DI and DJ. Obviously, the squared one plus the adjustment factor for di that's called g v di and the adjustment factor for dj the adjustment adjustment factor plays a major role out here and that kind of talks to the inefficiencies which you talked about the two two pieces one is a, you know the temperature in fahrenheit one is a pulley in one how is it really going to handle but uh, hold on there are more inefficiencies which we need to handle but we'll talk about that a little later uh, so you know d theta is a distance between the embeddings and you know g v is essentially a scalar output so this is you know where the different adjustment pro, you know uh, factor comes into play, uh, and G uh, you know GVDI is nothing but it's a summation, uh, uh, and we'll talk about GVX in a minute. Now to ensure that you get a non-negative output value, the final activation use an output layer of this network is squared. So basically, it's a, it's just another method just to make sure that you know you have non-negative output values. Let's speak a little bit on the adjustment factor, which is kind where you know most of the magic is happening in case of you know handling inefficiencies 
So the adjustment factor plays a major role for handle different distribution. So basically, the adjustment factor GV happens to be zero where the variables uh, you know, are same and they share the similar embeddings. Now GV needs to output large out, you know, uh, adjustment values for data sets with distribution that common among different variables in the repository uh, as uh, this would produce a low match property. So this is where the magic really happens. And now, so you have to understand the adjustment factor is, is, is the place which kind of handles inefficiencies. Um, now let's, let's move on to step four which talks about the training. Uh, training DI, DJ, uh, and Y, or Y is nothing but the probability with zero and one matches and non matches. So you got to go ahead and learn the neural net by optimizing standard cross entropy, entropy loss for binary classification. This is the loss formula. Network H and G are learned jointly via Adam stochastic gradient applied to the loss function. Fairly straightforward. So you have G, you have H. H is basically essentially the uh, where we learn the embeddings, G is basically where we kind of throw in the adjustment factors of various efficiencies. Uh, we've seen, in principle, uh, they kind of handle uh, all the inefficiencies which are stated in the paper, and we tried and tested that. So moving on further, there are still some consideration to be taken uh, into account. Um, so you know, we're dealing with data which is more than just uh, string or one type. So we are talking about the data which is going to be coming as string, integers, floats, blocks of text, and each of these, each of the, each of these needs a different handling. Now, string columns, which consist of English words, are converted into vectors using fast text vectors. So the problem really stems into the part. Okay, fine. You know, we can actually kind of talk about get embeddings around the part where you actually actually are using English. But apparently, when you're not using English, you're using something which is different. Uh, then in that case. How do we handle that? Uh, numeric columns essentially also have to be converted to a 32-bit representation, which is a fairly straightforward thing. The paper doesn't really go on to talk about uh, other numeric types, we you know the other number types in terms of the float part. That's an easier part to handle. So in both the cases, H and G, we are three fully connected layers of 300 nodes, each with value activation function and G, V with a tan H activation function in H of theta. H of theta produces a 300 dimensional vector. GV produces a scalar. Now for text other than English, this is where the piece is important. The, the, the text, you know, for the text other than English, we are using a bi-directional character level LST, LSTM. So there, you know, there's the two pieces. So basically you come into the part where you actually have questions in terms of how do I train the network? So you, the way we've trained the network, we've trained for strings and numeric, we kind of you know, gone ahead, one shot and train, but for text other than English, we have a different network to train separately. So, uh, you know, that ideally means that's a little bit overhead in terms of doing two, two steps, but, uh, you know, kind of talking more in terms of different architecture, this is what for integer English text, you can actually see on the left hand side, the number 42 is kind of converted into the binary representation, the word is into the fast text, and then you have H and G, uh, and the non-English text, we are essentially talking in terms of the bi-directional LSTM character level, uh, which apparently does the magic. For both these cases, the accuracy um, uh, and, the, and the validation seems to be pretty okay in the range of 80 to 90 percent, uh, and apparently it does work. Uh, talking a little bit more in terms of speed and generalization, paper proposes that their network architecture outperforms other statistic classifier on key metrics um, like precision recall AU and the metrics results may not fully capture the potential approaches. Chart demonstrate that Deep embeddings produce incremental improvement in most domain and breakthrough improvement in any uh, in in only a few. Uh, in terms of speeds, uh, the architecture of the network produces relatively fast algorithm instead of classifying the similarity of each pair of columns. The method only requires passing each column through each network once, and since grouping is performed by class clustering algorithm, so this it, it's it intent it seems to be fast. The place where it's kind of slow is in terms of non-English text. Uh, the bi training the bidirectional LSTM along with GNV tends to be uh, much slower, uh, so you've got to be patient out there. Finally, closing comments, uh, the paper in general works, and we've seen the output. So there's, the, the, you know, this, this research can actually be used in principle, uh, and the approach can be applied to different domains. Now, deep embedding have real potential and solution for schema matching. Now, table union search, where data tables are grouped according to uh, to if they share the same column. 
Uh, with embedding, pairwise distances merely must be aggregated in order to produce overall score indicating whether two tables are, you know, are, can be union or not. So it's another area where you can actually kind of see if you know you can really union or not. And we, you know, we feel yes, this if we test this approach as well, it seems to work. Solving the core problem of enti entity res resolution determines which records in the data sets refer to the same entity. Now, whether generated over rows or columns in a data table, deep, ending, deep embeddings are uh, an exciting development that push the envelope for data cleaning and data discovery. Now, with that being said, uh, thank you for attending this session.